seclusion at Y&R. And his name is Love Welchel III. And Love tells a story about him being at Y&R, and he got a certain offer. And the guy giving him an offer said, Love, I need to know whether you're going to take this job to run my company or not, and I need to know right now or I'm not going to have a very good weekend. And the call took place in the back of a car on a Friday afternoon. And the person that Love was speaking with was none other than Sean Combs. Hmm. And Love went on to help him run Bad Boy Entertainment for several years. So my point there is if Love would have been quote-unquote more civilized, he would have had to do a cost-benefit analysis, a SWOT analysis, pros and cons, etc. Instead, his whole life flashed before his eyes, and he took a breath. And he said, I'm in. And it was one of the best decisions he made. And what I've seen too much in the business world is a lot of CYA, and we all know what that stands for. I've seen a lot of analysis paralysis, which means that people are mobilized to make decisions. And if there's one silver lining around COVID-19, one trend that I'm seeing, and I'd be curious what, the other guests feel is an opportunity to recalibrate and think about what we really want out of life, especially during this primal moment where we're forced to confront our own mortality, basic needs like food and safety and shelter and security, and also at a time where we can get a glimpse into other people's lives. Like I, I think I'm the only one not calling from North Carolina, and I love that fact. You all are giving me a glimpse inside your world. I haven't been to Durham in five years, but I was there to visit a client, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, who you all know. And, you know, it's fascinating to, to see how our experiences are very similar, but also they're different in a beautiful and diverse way. So, you know, you kind of get that voyeur sense. Like, when, I don't know how many of you watched the NFL draft. Were any of you watching this year when they were zooming into players' living rooms? I and, saw a little bit of that on, on the computer. I didn't watch the total draft, but I did see that it was yeah. done in a more modern kind of version. Exactly. And guess what? It got record ratings because it wasn't the um, overly produced set. It was rather just getting real with it and getting inside people's homes and seeing them celebrate or seeing them concerned they weren't drafted, et cetera. And, and, and one final thought. Mark, I have you in mind with this. I had a tech client, a guy named David Rosenblatt, who sold DoubleClick to Google about a decade ago. And he's now the head of First Dibs, which is something you might have heard of. It's a platform for one-of-a-kind goods, a lot of it luxury, but not all only. And he turned me on to a charity called DonorsChoose.org. And basically, teachers and principals in rural districts and inner city districts get online and say, this is what I need for my classroom. Help me fund it. I don't get it from taxpayer dollars. What can we do to work together? And i got to tell you, it's been one of the most gratifying causes that I've been involved in. So a uh, little bit all over the place, but just thought I'd chime in with that. No, I appreciate that, and I'm sure Mike would as well. Um, it's actually interesting that you brought that up about the individual love and his experience with Sean um, Combs and everything, but we had a similar call. It was actually one of our um, special edition calls because some of these people are around the world, so we've actually arranged to have some calls with people that are not in a comfortable place to be calling 7 to 9. So we had a show that aired on um, Thursday with Ron Thomas, Ron Thomas is a human resource guy who is currently living out of Dubai, but he's originally from Marion, South Carolina, and spent some time with Martha Stewart in New York and everything. But he was talking about something very similar, which is that when he decided he wanted to go into consulting, and he's a business consultant now, an international business consultant, but when he decided he wanted to do that, he wanted to do speaking at, like, these business conferences, world business conferences. And as I recall the story, and Dean can correct me if I'm not if I'm paraphrasing it slightly wrong, but as I recall the story, what he basically did was he applied to about, um, I think he said somewhere like 
seven or eight different businesses, conferences, told them his background, and basically he took it from a position of not um, will you hire me, but his position was I have, this is my experience, this is what I've got going on, this is my background. If somebody drops out of the conference, call me. And in other words, because we know conferences are always being planned. They're always, and I've done event planning, so I know any event that you plan, Chalet can testify to this. They never go quite the way that you're planning. So that being said, she, he basically said, if anybody drops out, get in touch with me. And I want to say that he said that out of like six or seven of those contacts within, I think he said between two to three days, he had already received five calls to travel around the world to go be the speaker at these conferences because something like that had happened. But what he, his point that he was making was that he went at it from a position of power. He went at it not like begging for the job. He was like basically going as if to say, this is what skill set, this is what I've got going on. If this contingency happens, call me. And I thought that that was a really amazing story. And like I said, from there he now has offices in Dubai and he's doing this on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, if coronavirus wasn't going on, he would probably be in a different part of the world just about every day because he was doing that much kind of travel. But it was all based that when he started the business, he just kind of went for it. And I think that that's kind of the kind of conversation that you're talking about, Marco, is that sometimes we don't go for it. And I want to hear from everybody. And just to make one other quick correction, Dean is the only other person because Dean is calling from the New Jersey area. So you're right. Everybody else is out of the hey, North Carolina Dean, area, I'm whether that's Greensboro or Durham. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but Dean is over there. In, <laughs> yeah, Dean is in New Jersey. And um, I think, uh, Shalei, I know you've got an out-of-state uh, telephone number, but you are here in North Carolina. So where, where is your home base? You mentioned Utah, but where did you originally come from? Um, my home state is Virginia, Roanoke, Virginia, and then I lived in New York City for several years, so that's why I still have my 917 area code, but I'm actually in the Durham area now. Yes, I knew you were in the Durham area now, but I knew that you also had roots, and you'll also be glad there's a connection to you and Dean, because like I said, Dean lives in New Jersey now, but his college background was Virginia, and I want to say, Dean, most of your family is still in Virginia, is that correct in saying um, yeah, part of my family is in Virginia, other half is here in New Jersey. Right, so about half and half, half in Virginia and half in the uh, New Jersey area. But coming back to what Marco was saying, um, what are people's kind of feelings about what will happen? Because I am of the opinion that Marco said that we are in a new age and that this is causing people to reflect on their lives reflect on their uh, mortality, reflect on even maybe a new way of doing business. So I'm curious to hear everybody from, and we'll start, I'll go down the line. So I'll start with Mike, go to Hassan, then come to Shali, and end back with Marco. But um, what is your view of what this kind of virus and what the state of the world is now is going to do in terms of a new era? I mean, we have certain people in leadership, I won't name their names, that are still doing crazy things with tweets and asking people to drink Clorox and other kind of things. But minus them, what are your views about how this will impact us as a world society? Because one of my fears, and I've mentioned this in another conversation I had, might have been a personal conversation or it might have been one of my other uh, calls on something else, is that we sometimes become disaster-driven. Like I remember a lot of compassion with Katrina. I remember a lot of compassion with um, 9-11. And sometimes when we come out of the disaster, then we go back to our old ways of doing things. But because of the extent of this, 9-11 was a event that happened over the course of, I mean, the war still to some degree is still raging on, but the actual physical event was a, basically a two to three day event. Same with Katrina. It was not that long. This has been going on for months. So I'm thinking that this might be different than those, but I do know historically speaking, we kind of like have compassion in the heat of the disaster and then we go back to our old ways. But I'm thinking because of this being a more long haul kind of thing that it might change the nature of people. So I just want to know what your thoughts are on that and what your observations are. So I'll turn it over to you, Mike, and hear your reflections on that first. And then, like I said, I'll jump down to Hassan Shali and come back to Marco and see what his thoughts are on that. But how do you think this will impact us as a society? So I'll start with you, Mike. Um, like I said, I think things have just changed, right? And, you know, I was thinking about this a little while ago, how it's actually affected me, you know, and just in my everyday life, right? I can serve a little bit more now, 
right? And, um, uh, I don't take two paper towels out of the select the size paper towels. I take one, right? I uh, look at uh, do I use regular dishes or paper plates, right? Because you know we're gonna have to, it's kind of hard to get paper products now. I just think I think people are gonna take a step back and look at the world a little differently. How do we do things a little differently? You know, how important is it for students to have computers? Right in, in situations like this, or even anything that might come in, in the future, how important is it to, you know, support your local restaurants so that they stay in business? Because that's one of the things I'm trying to do too. Is once once or twice a week, you know, order from a local restaurant, not a chain. You know, I think, and one more thing, I think it's going to be really, really big that comes out of this is to focus on what what we consider essential workers. You know, these are the same workers who people don't want to pay fifteen dollars an hour to, but they're they're requesting them to be in, to 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 go into work to serve, you know, the greater community. They consider them essential. Well, maybe these people are a little more important than your your denial of them having at least fifteen dollars an hour living wage, because they're up here serving you. They're risking their lives at grocery stores the cashier, you know, the restaurant workers and so forth, so that you can have what you need, but but you don't want to pay them $15 an hour. So I just think people are going to take a step back and look at some of the things that are going on. What have you gone without? What what can you not go without? And I think those things are going to change a little bit just because of the way, you know, life has changed. Definitely. Hassan, you're the youngest person in this group, recall and everything. Now, like I said, I first met you when you were actually, I won't say when we first met in the Poetry Slam community, you were actually a high school kid. But like I said, you're a college age person now, so definitely in that 20 set. So definitely the, the youngest of the panel right now. But what are your age range thinking about how this is going to change the world? I mean, you're still relatively young yourself, but you're seeing a major event happen in the early part of your life. So just what are your reflections on how it will change? And I'm actually going to put you on the spot. After you answer that question, before I get to Shali, if you can drop at least a verse so folks can hear what you're all about, that would also be appreciated. But the first I want you to answer that question, then if you can drop a verse, that would be appreciated. <laughs> um, I, y'all, y'all didn't have to do that. Yeah, I got you though. Um, I so see now you done affected my answer because I'm thinking about the verse. You see what you did there? But it's cool. I think that this for so, okay. So I think that this event is traumatic. So I think it's gonna dig deep into the psyches of people. I think it is gonna change how they think, how they interact, how they appreciate life. Um, I think it's gonna change behavior as far as you know how people operate in public spheres. But I think what this event did was it also reset a lot. It also destroyed a lot. And people are having to come at the future at a new angle. So it's kind of, it's it's shuffled everything. I think that it, it's closed doors for some. Um, but I feel like even those who, who think, I, I've been watching a lot of the people around me and listening to them and talking to them and supporting them. And what I'm starting to see from people is that you really, you really control your perception of your reality. Like you really do. Like even as an artist, we have so much, we have so much confidence and we have so much joy. Or we find so much passion in something that other people look at us and they're just like, this, this isn't actually the life. Like, I don't know what you, I don't know what you're really enjoying about this, but okay. I think it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing nowadays. It's just like people who choose to live in the fear, people who choose to live in the misery, people who choose to live in the sadness, people who choose to hold on to what they lost or what's going wrong or to absorb themselves in the news and, and, and literally make themselves sad, make themselves worse off, they're, they're going to be worse off. People who are going to try and get back to normal, or trying to get back to a world that is behind us, you feel me? I feel like they're going to go backwards. And I feel like the people who choose to look at this and find the positive and find the new and find the lesson and find the progression and find the window that opened because that door has closed, those are the people who are going to go into this next decade um, 
you feel me, prospering and on the right foot. Like, one of the things that 